can answer them uh, on voice. And now recording is on. Um, did I forget anything? No. So uh, we've been uh, we've been working with uh, pulp uh, uh, the pulp platform for a couple of years now. We uh, even visited them a couple of years ago in Zurich. That was a really nice visit. Really cool. They are doing a lot of very cool things. And the result of this collaboration has been uh, the AI deck. So the AI deck initially was designed over there, or start from a started from a design they had, and uh, and that we could uh, take over somehow and then share it to the world. Uh, and we're very very pleased to uh, welcome uh, Daniel Pelosi, that will uh, talk to us about um, deep learning. AI deck and what they are doing at uh, Pulp Platform. So, Daniel, stage is yours. Thanks, Erno. Hi, everyone. I'm Daniele Palossi, as uh, I've been introduced, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Dalle Molle Institute for Artificial Intelligence in south of Switzerland, in Lugano, and at the ETH Zurich. As uh, you already know, this talk will be about deep learning and the work that we are doing with the PAL platform on our favorite uh, nano drone, the Crazy Fly. So let's jump into it. This is a bit of the agenda of the next um, 50 minute uh, talk. I will um, split it uh, into parts. The first one will be quite lightweight in introductory for everyone. I know the audience is quite uh, wide and comes from different uh, uh, fields, let's say. So I, I will try to uh, to make uh, an effort to bring everyone to the same level. So for someone maybe it will uh, I will present things already known. For someone else, uh, new stuff. Be patient because then the second part will focus on the more uh, interesting I think uh, uh, part of the talk with the research that we are doing in the field. So a bit of example application and what is going on with Pulp and uh, uh, the Crazy Fly. For questions, uh, I uh, ask you to uh, collect them and uh, go through at the end well, where I will uh, answer all of them. I will try my best to satisfy all your curiosity and uh, potential questions. Okay, we said PALP. PALP stands for Parallel Ultra Low Power. This is a quite uh, mature project started uh, seven years uh, ago with a collaboration between the University of Bologna in Italy and the ETH uh, uh, of Zurich. In this, uh, within this project, uh, there are many, many people working on, uh, PhD students, uh, uh, senior scientists, uh, and professors, uh, and so on. And uh, it was, uh, it is, uh, uh, led by Professor Luca Benini. And uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, this, uh, this project was uh, started with a goal, with a clear goal in mind, to create a compute platform, a new compute platform for researchers, but not only, with a, a strong aim of energy efficiency, so to bring it to the next level. And this is a quite relevant in many fields. First of all, uh, Internet of Things, if you think about a computing system in, the, in that domain, but also, as you can see, we'll see in this, uh, in this talk, also for autonomous uh, nanodrones. Another key aspect of the PALP project was the philosophy of open source hardware. So to make it available for all collaborators, universities, and also for industrial exploitation. To start, we want to have a clean slate, so to remain compatible, so to, to, to avoid to remain, uh, to, to, not, uh, to not need dependency from any commercial IT, and uh, be compatible with the legacy systems. Uh, back in time, in 2013, we started with the instruction set architecture of uh, OpenRISC, and then around uh, mid-2016, uh, we switched uh, to the RISC-5 uh, uh, architecture, that is uh, the one that uh, we are still uh, using and we plan to use uh, for, the, for the next uh, uh, period. Then, we started, of course, uh, with the uh, heart of the, of the system, the course. We developed, optimized, and extended instruction set architecture with a few cores. Then we moved into peripherals because you only you don't only need a computational device, but also the capability to 
interact with the external world and they interconnect among the various parts of the system on chip, as well as we worked and we work uh, on uh, the accelerator side of the system on chip. Then with this element, basic element available, we been able to combine them into different flavors. From uh, you see here on the X axis, these uh, extreme edges of the application spectrum from the IoT domain to the high performance computing domain. All of them are mapped with a specific uh, configuration of these basic ingredients. If you look at the very left part of the of the plot, you see the single core architectures where you have one of these uh, RISC-V based core with of course uh, the interfaces, uh, memory, and uh, all that is needed uh, to address IoT application use case. Then jumping to the extreme uh, edge on the right, uh, you have uh, this uh, multi-cluster architecture where you combine not only multiple cores, uh, but organized uh, in different clusters. And in the middle, you have the template, the architectural template that is uh, used in this, uh, uh, in this application of uh, autonomous nano drones. I will refer to this uh, from now on uh, for the rest of the talk. And this architecture is organized with one cluster. So you have one uh, domain with multiple instances, uh, identical instances of the same uh, RISC-V uh, core. Okay, so what, uh, what we did in this uh, long time was uh, not only to design and to uh, validate uh, our uh, work uh, with PALP, but also to take out uh, quite a lot of those uh, chips. Here you see for each planet, basically, uh, each planet represents a, a chip that has been taken out. Many of them are research projects, uh, another significant part are student projects, and a few of them are research collaboration. On the y-axis, you see also the technology that have been used for that specific uh, chip, as well as on the x-axis, the, uh, the actual chip taped out uh, with the, uh, the mask. And uh, what, uh, what is also interesting is to see the evolution or the various uh, dimension of the chip in terms of gate that uh, is represented by the area of uh, all these uh, planets. But among uh, all of them, there is one that is uh, quite uh, interesting for us, that is uh, the GAP-8 uh, system on chip. This uh, started with a collaboration with the uh, Green Wave Technology, a startup uh, in uh, France, a fabless uh, startup that uh, brought the uh, initial, initial design to an industry level. And this is actually today available for uh, commercial usage. You can buy them. This is the first uh, uh, commercial embodiment of the PALP uh, system on chip. You can see in this picture that the chip, including all the package, uh, is uh, quite small, and if you think about uh, the die inside, it's uh, even smaller, of course, but it's uh, as big as uh, three square millimeters. So you, you can start, uh, start feeling uh, a bit the uh, dimension and the compatibility with a small drone like the Crazy Fly. It is a very small, and we will see even more uh, how energy efficient it is and all the features that we then leverage. So the consortium or the uh, partners uh, that uses uh, uh, PALP are quite uh, a few. Big player, Greenwaves, uh, first of all, of course. Uh, and as you can see here in this uh, slide, uh, many, many big uh, companies, but also many collaborations with the universities and uh, um, institution for uh, uh, research. Good. As Arnaud introduced before, the very first uh, idea started from a prototype or a, a research path that uh, we've been working on a few years ago. And the, everything started with this um, ultra low power heterogeneous model. So the heterogeneous model for uh, whom um, doesn't know the uh, template is characterized, is very popular, is uh, used in many, many devices, and is characterized by a uh, uh, host, kind of a coordinator of the activities uh, of the system, and uh, an accelerator. That uh, the most common instance uh, is, for example, the CPU and the GPU that you have in your computer, in your laptop. So you have uh, two different devices uh, that are specifically uh, crafted or uh, 
them used for a specific task. If you want to interface with the external world, the MCU can easily offer many interfaces. If you need to perform heavy computational workload, the accelerator, the GPU, or the cluster, in our case, is the, is the way to go. And as I said, this is for us, the, this part was represented by this uh, multi-core cluster that uh, I showed you before. I don't know, I think there is a mic on with a bit of noise. Uh, uh, maybe a printer is going on. Do you know if, do you, I don't know, do you hear any noise in the yeah, background? Yes. I think there is a mic on. <laughs> okay. Let's continue. Hopefully, it will uh, it will go off. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Then what we did was to bring uh, this uh, heterogeneous model to one board compatible with the crazy fly. So it was uh, our first design, the prototype done at ETH that we called the Pulp Shield. The Pulp Shield features this uh, GAP-8 system on chip, but not only. We also extended uh, this uh, design with additional off-chip memory and uh, a very small uh, ultra-low power camera, front-looking uh, camera. And then we released open source our hardware design, all the work we did, and this uh, was the, the bridge to go into what you probably know, that is the AI deck optimized by BitCraze and GreenWaves technology and made available for all of you. So in the end, the robotic platform that we use and that we, we refer in the next part of the talk is uh, probably the one that uh, you're also are, uh, quite familiar with, composed by the CrazyFly main board the AI deck as extension of the computational capabilities and the flow deck to improve the uh, state estimation of, uh, of the system. As you know, you have uh, many possibilities to connect uh, with the uh, base station, with your laptop. You have the Nordic radio on the base uh, system, but you also have an additional channel with the AI deck that wasn't uh, uh, present in our first prototype, this uh, uh, ESP32 Wi-Fi. So you also have this high bandwidth channel to stream images and data directly from your GAP-8 system on chip. Okay, let's move a bit into the details of the ADAC and the system on chip. Here you see the overall picture, the big picture of the system. I will introduce you now every component so everyone should be familiar for the rest of the talk with the device. First of all, as I said, we introduced external memory, additional DRAM and flash in this AI deck. You can see them as a hybrid package featuring both of them in the same chip. And this is the biggest storage memory you have in the, in the system. So you already can see that dimension capacity in terms of memory is not as big as other devices or embedded devices or big drones. We, we will return on this uh, on this point. As I said, uh, we introduced uh, these uh, QGA uh, 320 times 240 grayscale uh, camera, the produced by IMAX, and uh, the um, ESP32 Wi-Fi. Then moving into the GAP8 uh, system on chip. First of all, as uh, uh, I tried to introduce before, we have two domains. The fabric controller on one side, that is uh, this guy orchestrating the work, interfacing with the external peripherals and sensors, and organizing um, the data transfer for the cluster, that is the second domain. And this one is uh, the computationally powerful heavy-duty horse, so to accelerate, to perform general purpose computation. I will go into details in a short while. Uh, the first part. I want to introduce about the fabric controller is the rich set of uh, interfaces to access uh, many devices, many sensors in the in the board, and uh, um, that can be plugged to the to the system on chip. Then the biggest internal uh, memory, the L2 S RAM, and uh, as big as 512 kilobytes. So we are narrowing down the capacity of uh, the memories uh, available. We started from the 64 megabyte of flash. 8 megabytes of DRAM, but then when you go in chip, 
inside the chip, the dimension uh, drops to 512 kilobytes. And the micro DMA. This is a quite uh, nice uh, uh, piece of work. It is a, a very powerful DMA in charge of transferring uh, data from the external devices to the L2 um, on chip uh, memory. It, it offers a very uh, handy functionalities like uh, bi dimensional transfers, but most importantly, it allows you to running uh, the data transfer in the background with respect to the activities uh, of the core, so in a pipeline fashion. And then, of course, uh, we have uh, this uh, single core uh, RISC-5 uh, uh, part of the chip that is uh, uh, in charge of organizing the work for the cluster. Moving into that, we have uh, even smaller uh, 64 kilobyte uh, memory, this uh, L1 tightly coupled uh, data memory, but uh, very fast uh, with a low latency access. So um, in, a, in this field, um, you have a concept, the data locality. Usually what you want to have is to use uh, the closest and fastest, fastest memory to access your data all the time. But in this case, in the case of Pulp, as you see, there is uh, no cache, so you have to organize uh, these uh, uh, data transfer and movement so to have every time all the data you need without wasting uh, uh, any energy waiting uh, for a refill of this uh, L1 memory. And uh, to do so, we have uh, this uh, DMA that is in charge of the transfer between the L2 and the L1 to keep always uh, the uh, pipeline full of, of data to be processed. Last but not least, the general purpose cluster. These are eight instances of the same RISC-V core we saw before, and uh, it is quite uh, uh, well performing in, of course, in parallel processing, but also in um, digital signal uh, operation. Last remark of this, uh, of this uh, part of this overview is that we do not have harder support for floating point computation that is uh, quite common in many microcontrollers. Okay, I dig into the um, device. Uh, I show you the uh, AI deck, the pulp system on chip, but uh, one step back. Why pulp on a nanodrone? Why do we need uh, this pulp uh, on, uh, on our crazy fly? Well, everything started with the research question on how to bring a complex uh, sensor duct capabilities uh, into this uh, small size drone. And when I say small size, uh, you should already understand that I'm referring to resource constraint. Memory is a very limited, uh, uh, computational power is not comparable with a GPU or uh, any uh, high-end embedded device because we are in the ultra low power scale. So the uh, state of the art in this, uh, in this field uh, is uh, probably known by all of you with uh, big machines, uh, what we call the standard size uh, drone that, are, uh, that can afford for a very powerful uh, CPU and embedded devices uh, on board. But this is due to the dimension because uh, having a big dimension means uh, um, payload and also the capability to bring uh, powerful batteries uh, to uh, power fancy and uh, uh, very high-end uh, devices. We're talking about hundreds of watts total power consumption of a standard size drone. Think about uh, the Skydio or uh, the uh, Phantom 4 from uh, DJI. There are many very nice, uh, very powerful, capable of uh, amazing features. They can follow you, they can avoid collision meanwhile uh, shooting uh, at your uh, uh, activities, uh, making great videos. So. Very, very nice machine, but quite big. Then the more you decrease with the size, uh, moving into the micro size, nano size, and pico size, uh, the extreme edge, of course, uh, the form factor, the payload, uh, and the availability of power reduces. So what we are interested in is the nano size. Our research has started uh, from the nano size, that is actually the size of the crazy fly, and uh, all those uh, characteristics uh, are decreased, so smaller, less power, less payload, uh, we cannot afford for a big uh, computational platform on board because what we want to achieve is uh, autonomous navigation, not automatic, uh, meaning uh, 
that there is uh, a remote machine performing that autonomous, that uh, all of the um, needs for the task must be addressed with the onboard uh, features and uh, um, resources. So if you look at the uh, power, the overall power consumption of these devices and you think and you keep in mind that uh, the uh, breakdown of this power, it is uh, uh, showing that uh, most of the energy of the power, um, around 90%, uh, between 85 and 90% is used for the motors. The fraction that is left for computation, it, it is quite small, as small as hundreds of milliwatts. And with these uh, hundreds of milliwatts, what we want to do is the same level of intelligence, or, or maybe hopefully even more than a big uh, platform. And all of these uh, must run in real time because uh, we need to be prompt uh, to react to the environment and interacting uh, with uh, uh, the surroundings. So let's jump into the uh, more uh, research-oriented uh, uh, part of the talk. The first work we did with this uh, PALP uh, and uh, the goal uh, to enable high-level intelligence on board uh, these uh, uh, nano-drone crazy fly started from uh, Dronet. Dronet was um, a very successful uh, previous work done at the Robotic and Perception Group of uh, UZH um, with this, uh, um, with this um, ResNet-based uh, CNN. So they developed uh, this uh, network. Uh, for, for uh, autonomous driving of uh, a bigger drone, a Bebop Parrot was used at that time. And uh, what the CNN is doing, given one front-looking image, is predicting uh, two outputs. A steering angle to uh, solve the task of lane detection, so to keep the lane, like a, an autonomous driving car, and a probability of collision, to prevent the collision with both static and dynamic obstacles that might appear in front of the um, of the robot, of the drone. The setup that they used at that time was with a remote laptop streaming images, performing the computation on a powerful Intel i7 CPU, and closing the loop, providing the drone forward velocity and steering angle that are basically the output of, of the network. This uh, model, this uh, deep learning model, was characterized by this, uh, as you can see in the picture, this uh, shallow ResNet-based uh, topology featuring uh, uh, 41 million MAC operation per frame. MAC stands for multiply and accumulate. That is uh, the basic uh, unit uh, of computation uh, of operation that every CNN has to do. And uh, with uh, more than one megabyte of uh, parameters. So if you, if you think about the dimension of the on-chip memory I told you before, we have uh, way less than that. So one megabyte is, starts to be quite a lot. OK, and they were using the, um, the CPU of the, of the laptop. From uh, here, just a, a bit of overview of the uh, accuracy and the uh, root mean square error of this uh, uh, original work that was used that was using uh, two different uh, data sets, the um, well-known Udacity data set from uh, the uh, autonomous driving uh, domain for, the, for uh, training and uh, evaluating uh, the steering angle uh, problem, the regression problem, and then a custom-made uh, data set for the probability of collision task called the Zurich Bicycle. Good. So what we did at that time was to develop a methodology so to squeeze, uh, to reduce uh, both uh, the uh, computational workload and the memory footprint uh, to fit into our PALP uh, system on chip uh, on the PALP shield, uh, the prototype that we did at that time uh, aboard uh, the Crazy Fly. We uh, introduced uh, several um, tricks, uh, let's say, so to bring uh, down the size. Here now I will show you a comparison, a table uh, with all uh, the uh, impact of all those uh, optimization uh, with respect to the RMC and the accuracy, the two metrics uh, used for uh, assessing the goodness uh, of, uh, of the network. And uh, keep in mind that, that the goal of this stage uh, wasn't uh, to improve uh, the performance, the regression and classification performance, but was actually to keep at least uh, the same 
meanwhile uh, shrinking down the size uh, and the footprint uh, of the neural network. So the first one, as I said before, we didn't, uh, we don't have any floating point unit uh, on the on the device, so it was uh, to move uh, to fixed point uh, arithmetic, and we used int 16 data type, uh, reducing of course by half the dimension of uh, um, the memory used for the parameters. Then we moved to a more comfortable, I would say, hardly uh, hardware friendly. Uh, max pooling a receptive field of two times two with uh, a small uh, loss in accuracy, but with uh, a bit of uh, gain in terms of uh, performance. And once again, if you look at the RMC and accuracy, we are still uh, aligned with the original uh, baseline. Then the last uh, um, improvement we did was to extend the data sets with additional images that taken directly from the ultra low power camera aboard the uh, the nano drone and um, this actually as you can see for uh, in particular for the accuracy metric improved uh, a bit the performance and this is something that uh, we would expect because as you know in this uh, in this field uh, of uh, deep learning uh, the data set is quite important so extending it uh, with uh, more than a thousand more uh, new images uh, introduce uh, more variants that is uh, beneficial in general, independently from the specific. But into the uh, specific context of this nanodrone, this was uh, quite useful also to start uh, uh, introducing in the network uh, the knowledge and the uh, photometric properties of the actual camera that we used. Because if you think about the uh, original data set used for training, this uh, Udacity and Zurich bicycle, they were acquired with high resolution cameras that is not what we have on board of the drone. So the first round of optimization from a network point of view was quite successful, reducing the, um, the, 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 the memory footprint, improving the performance, but still keeping in check the um, metrics on the testing set. Then we had to move into other optimization, for example, the memory orchestration. I will be very uh, fast on this part, uh, might be uh, too boring uh, for uh, some of you, but uh, just to, 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 to get uh, the, um, the message, uh, you know that uh, we have a very constrained memories and what we want to have is uh, the full uh, utilization of the uh, cluster parallel compute uh, unit. So, to do that, uh, we need to move all the data, all the tensor uh, in and out um, from the various uh, um, hierarchy of the of the memory in a, in a pipeline fashion, uh, so to have always uh, a um, sufficient workload uh, to feed uh, all the cores. Because if all cores are doing useful uh, computation all the time, we achieve the best performance uh, we can, and we use at best uh, our architecture. So we worked in collaboration with Green Waves, uh, developing uh, a very first version uh, of this uh, auto tiler, so to keep uh, data moving uh, in and out uh, in a pipeline uh, execution uh, fashion and uh, with uh, double buffering, meaning uh, splitting the, um, the tensor, the intermediate feature map, uh, the filters uh, that are the weights uh, in a sub chunk, so to have a small unit uh, uh, always avail available in the L1 memory that is the fastest and the closest to the uh, eighth course of the class. Then also another optimization carried out was this uh, execution orchestration. Also here I will be, um, I will try to be as high level as possible. Also in this case, as I said, what you want to have is the full utilization of the course all the time. But uh, as you know, the tensor shape uh, in the various layers of the neural network uh, changes uh, in, the, in the form. Usually you get smaller feature map, but with a higher number of channels. And therefore we have to develop a, a strategy so to, to have always the best split, the best partition among these data to keep all cores uh, up and running, uh, doing useful work. And this resulted in what we call the spatial scheme for the first layer that has very big feature maps, but with a few number of channels, 
moving to the feature-wise scheme for the rest of the layers of the network, the deepest, where we have a very small feature map, but for a, a very high number of uh, channels. In this way, we, uh, we are sure that uh, the, all the cores uh, are always uh, full of uh, useful work. And you can see here, basically, what the autotiler generates in terms of uh, um, tiling loops, uh, so to match those two uh, execution uh, schemes. OK, a bit of uh, performance uh, evaluation and uh, uh, power analysis, as we are very interested in those uh, constraints that uh, in respecting those constraints that I've introduced uh, before. First of all, we sweeped the uh, configuration of the GAP-8 system on chip, both a fabric controller and a cluster, because uh, you can actually uh, tune the frequency um, it runs. And uh, as you can see here, we played uh, quite a lot, uh, even uh, um, behind the specification that are 175 megahertz for the cluster. And uh, uh, we did that so to uh, analyze and understand what was uh, the most energy efficient uh, configuration that resulted in the fabric controller at 50 megahertz and the cluster at 100 megahertz. And this is a, maybe a, a funny note on the side. This uh, is a quite important uh, if you want to really use at best your device because um, uh, for example, one uh, usual issue in uh, uh, under utilization of uh, the parallel uh, uh, resource is uh, to uh, be in idleness because you need to refill uh, the memory to move uh, data that uh, is not available when you would need them. And this is, uh, of course, as uh, I told you before, is something that you can automate with this micro DMA and the, D and the D DMA. But you have also to keep in mind that the uh, frequency of those uh, devices depends on the frequency of the, uh, for example, the fabric controller. So if we have a very uh, um, low uh, frequency configuration for the fabric controller, it means also the DMA will operate uh, with lower frequency. That might not be as uh, good to keep always uh, fed the cluster with uh, uh, ab abundant uh, data. And therefore, you, you hit uh, some idleness uh, cycles, uh, and then you get uh, a less efficient uh, configuration. But in this case, uh, we, um, we explored uh, the, the various configurations, and we got this uh, very uh, efficient uh, uh, point. Then, considering uh, the performance that for us is the throughput, uh, the frame per second uh, that we can process, uh, and the total power consumption of the, uh, of the system, we, for all those uh, configuration of before, we, we did uh, all the evaluation with uh, the actual hardware, and uh, we highlight in this uh, plot uh, two uh, very interesting points. The first one is uh, the one for the most energy efficient configuration, and uh, with uh, these um, 150 megahertz for the fabric controller and 100 megahertz for the cluster, we achieved the six frame per second throughput uh, with only 45 milliwatts of power consumption. Then, pushing at the maximum the frequencies of both uh, fabric controller and cluster, we achieved 18 frames per second within 272 uh, milliwatts. That is uh, quite a lot, but still compatible with uh, um, the, 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 the small drone we, we used. OK, let's move into the most interesting, probably, um, result uh, part of this uh, work. And uh, we did uh, two experiments. The first one was uh, to evaluate, to assess the longest path that the drone was able to fly autonomously without uh, any additional uh, uh, external help indoor. And we performed these uh, more hundred, hundred uh, meters uh, long uh, uh, path with uh, uh, U-turn at the end of the corridor. This was uh, uh, in Zurich, uh, in our uh, universities. And uh, here you can see the, <laughs> the, the, the drone flying uh, um, around uh, in the corridor. Then the second test we did was to assess the goodness of the uh, collision avoidance uh, uh, part of the network. And we sweeped various uh, um, average flight speeds to understand, to identify 
what was the limit uh, to prevent a collision with a dynamic obstacle popping up only two meters in front of the drone. Here in this uh, uh, second video, you can see on the bottom also the output of the collision from the network. The drone is flying, the carton aboard is popping up, and you, you saw the, um, the spike of, of the network and the drone stopping uh, in front of the carton board. That wasn't here, appears, and it stops. And this was um, the uh, very first work, uh, complete, uh, complete uh, pipeline, so from the model, the deployment, and the testing in field, and we used this uh, um, um, pulp shield that I mentioned before, our prototype. Here to summarize uh, a bit of what uh, I, uh, I show you with this uh, pulp drone at V1, and we used the tensor flow at that time for the quantization part. We implemented the custom uh, script in the in the um, TensorFlow model, and uh, all all of that is uh, available online. Uh, is uh, open source uh, since a while by now. But what next? So we keep working with this uh, Pulse Dronet, uh, and uh, we moved into what we call the Pulse Dronet uh, V2. This is uh, an intermediate step. We are aiming uh, and uh, at a uh, um, more uh, interesting pulp drone at v3 version but it was uh, required uh, so to bring the pulp drone at, uh, on the ai deck if you go on our github uh, web page uh, you can actually find the um, the new models uh, now in pytorch because uh, we also moved into much more friendly tools and we did some evaluation of two uh, pipelines of two uh, workflow one called the gap flow that is uh, the official uh, set of uh, tools from green waves uh, technology and another one that is uh, called the nemo and dory uh, basically are two tools uh, developed at the university of uh, bologna that are in charge uh, nemo of the quantization part and dory of uh, the tiling part the uh, c code generation so to have the application running on the on the GAP-8 uh, system on chip. And uh, also another interesting aspect, we increased the strength of the quantization from 16 bits to 8 bits. The first outcome was, of course, half uh, of the memory was required with this, is required with this uh, V2, but also there is a, a publication about that, if you are curious, also the accuracy in terms of regression and uh, classification didn't uh, drop. So with, there is still uh, seems uh, to be some room for improvement in terms of uh, quantization. And uh, with uh, all these uh, modification in place, uh, the new performance, uh, the new scores that we achieved are reported here. So as you can see, we are um, these two couple of uh, um, frame rate and power consumption refers to, as before, to the most energy efficient configuration and the max performance one, where keep in mind that in these, uh, these numbers refers to a cluster running at 175 megahertz, while before uh, the max performance was uh, with a cluster overclocked, basically, at 250 uh, megahertz. And you can see that we gain both in terms of uh, throughput, uh, but also in terms of uh, uh, power consumption. So a step forward uh, towards what uh, hopefully soon uh, we will uh, uh, present the pulp drone uh, V3. And uh, part of this uh, comparison, the gap flow and the Nemo Dory that I told you before is reported also here in terms of the, this is the uh, waveform of the, of the power consumption during one frame inference. You can actually I, you can identify the various uh, layer of the convolutional neural network, and uh, on average, uh, the two uh, flows uh, behave uh, quite uh, quite the same. So we have uh, an average power of 40 milliwatts for the gap flow and uh, 35 milliwatts for the Nemo Dory, with a bit of uh, um, smallest uh, uh, execution time. So it is a bit faster than Nemo Dory, but this is due to the different approaches in the tiling scheme. So for this network, the Nemo Dory was 
um, was performing a bit better because most, most suitable for uh, this uh, specific uh, uh, topology. Okay, then the second part of the uh, research update with a uh, quite different uh, application. In this case, uh, this, uh, the, the one that you saw before was a pulp drone, it was the first uh, uh, step into this uh, autonomous uh, navigation with the pulp and the crazy flight. We move forward, of course, and uh, we did that with a new task that in this case was a human robot interaction. So we started uh, once again from a very successful previous work done at the uh, institute where I am now, uh, the ITSIA, uh, from uh, a colleague of mine, Dario Mantegazza, that was uh, this uh, proximity neural network. Also in this case, uh, the topology was uh, uh, based on ResNet, and the task that the neural network was performing was um, the uh, human pose estimation. So from uh, uh, feeding the network uh, with in input one front looking uh, feature of, from the onboard camera on a big drone at that time, um, the network was computing the relative pose of the uh, subject of the human in front of the drone with respect to the drone itself. And this uh, is represented here in the output with these uh, four numbers, four parameters, uh, x, y, x, that is the position and these uh, phi angle, uh, that is the relative angle between the drone and the, um, and the subject. Now here in this picture, you don't see the rest net bypass that was used at the beginning, but this is because um, I, I'm showing you the uh, modification we did because we want to move forward with respect to the pulp drone. So we start asking ourselves new questions. First of all, was uh, do we really need the rest net topology because um, uh, of the uh, vanishing gradient uh, effect uh, on such a small network? And the answer seems to be no. We, without uh, bypasses of uh, typical of the ResNet uh, topology, we can achieve very good, good performance, as I will show you in a short while. Then the second question we asked uh, with this uh, pulp front net uh, work uh, was, um, what happened if we reduce the model size? You can see here you have uh, uh, three configuration of the input image that are uh, coupled with the three configuration of the uh, channels uh, of each layer. And this is was to reduce both um, uh, footprint of, the, of the, um, the number of parameters and also the computation required by uh, these uh, three versions. And we assess the effect, the ultimate effect on the infield behavior, reducing uh, um, getting the smaller and smaller input image uh, with uh, less uh, number of channels. Also for this, uh, I will show you uh, in a few slides um, a bit of uh, quantitative uh, results. For this work, uh, given the time uh, was, uh, uh, was mature for uh, the AI deck, uh, the commercial uh, um, board and the new tools, uh, we took advantage of them and we used uh, the AI deck uh, with the Nemo and Dory uh, tools from University of, uh, uh, of Bologna. So the methodology that we use to train and to evaluate uh, the uh, testing performance of this uh, pulp front net was uh, starting with collecting a lot of images from our uh, mock-up equipped uh, room. So the drone uh, looking at the person, uh, various position, various uh, uh, subjects, <clears throat> and we collected them quite a few images uh, distributed in different uh, uh, sessions that we use uh, both for training and for uh, validation. But before uh, the training was performed in this work, we introduced also one augmentation stage to improve uh, the um, capability of the network to generalize and to better understand the, um, uh, the work. Uh, I will give you a bit more detail on this augmentation uh, right after this, uh, this part. And uh, um, as usually in this uh, application domain, we split uh, other session. Keep in mind that among all of them, uh, we never repeat the subject. So the subject, the person that the drone see during training is never the same person so during uh, testing. So to, uh, to have a stronger uh, evaluation, uh, more reliable and uh, uh, more representative. The augmentation, I said. Yes, we 
we introduced um, two classes of augmentation. The first one was uh, what we call the pitch augmentation. So basically, if you have a, a bigger image uh, with respect to what you need uh, on, the, um, on, the, on the network, uh, what you can do is to simulate uh, is a synthetic augmentation still has uh, some uh, good effect. Simulate different uh, uh, pitch uh, cropping the image at different uh, height of the full resolution. In this case, it was 160 times 160 cropped to 96 pixel height. Then we applied a very traditional uh, photometric augmentation like, like brightness, uh, contrast, uh, blur, vignetting, uh, flipping, and so on and so forth. So to extend uh, the dimension of the training uh, data set. Good. I spoke before about uh, uh, performance. Here, a bit of uh, uh, um, quantitative results. We show here this uh, coefficient of determination, the R-square metric, and we put in comparison all the three models uh, we proposed, reducing uh, the model size, but also this uh, original work, the pro proximity neural network as a um, safety check to, to keep everything uh, comparable. We present the full precision uh, model, the floating point uh, 32, but also the quantized uh, at 8 bits. And as you can see here for the four output uh, variables, the um, comparison, first of all, the, um, the change from full precision to quantization is never a problem. For all the configuration, all the output variables, uh, you see very similar results. Sometimes the quantize is slightly better, but this is just the normal noise <coughs> of the process. So from this point of view, everything seems to be very solid. Then comparing a bit of performance with the baseline for X, Y, and also Z, almost for uh, all of them, the comparison is uh, uh, very um, very similar with the close uh, uh, performance, but on the feet, the output uh, of the of the angle, we have uh, a bit of uh, unexpected uh, behavior for the smallest network, and this is actually uh, something that is uh, due to the specific metric we used because um, the R square is uh, quite uh, severe. That, that's why we like it, because uh, it, is, uh, it is hard uh, to trick uh, the R square metric, uh, because it is um, keeping uh, in, the, in the formulation of this uh, uh, metric, uh, you also have, uh, let's say, a factor that is uh, telling how easy or hard it is uh, to predict uh, on that specific uh, uh, data set, uh, testing data set, and this is given by the variance. So if the data set has a very small variance, that means uh, all the labels, all the ground true are very close uh, to the mean, then uh, as soon as you do some uh, small error, this is uh, penalized because uh, in that case, uh, a predictor that would uh, predict always the mean, the, the average, uh, would behave uh, very well. But the opposite also is true. If the data set is uh, quite uh, sparse, has a big variance, the R square will not penalize uh, that much. Uh, uh, small errors. And this is basically what you see here, because uh, the data sets we used doesn't have uh, that much uh, variety on the, uh, on the front angle. Okay, second part of the uh, performance uh, result in terms of a throughput as before, the frame rate and the power consumption for this uh, new neural network. As always, uh, we are interested in the peak throughput, uh, the most energy efficient configuration, and the minimum uh, power consumption and uh, the relative uh, performance of uh, each configuration. So we saw that the max, per max performance, uh, uh, sorry, max power consumption is given, of course, by the biggest model running at the maximum frequencies. And with this uh, model, we achieve 110 frame per second inference uh, on board within 99 milliwatts. Then, if we move at the most energy efficient configuration that is uh, represented by the 80 times 32 model, we obtain 48 frames per second within only 20 milliwatts. If you remember the pulse drone, you, you, you see the, the evolution. We are going uh, down and down uh, with, the, with, the, with the requirements in terms of power, but we are getting uh, uh, much better uh, throughput. Of course, uh, we are talking of two different tasks, 
but still the, the uh, strongest uh, quantization and all these techniques uh, start to really playing a role. As um, uh, for the minimum power consumption within uh, 19 frames per second within only 8.6 milliwatts. So really uh, little power for having this uh, uh, prediction uh, running on board. Then a bit of uh, uh, demonstration in field testing. This is the setup that we uh, we used with uh, this uh, predefined path of the user, so to make it uh, reproducible. And uh, this uh, is the behavior of the drone. Here you see the front looking image on board the drone, external view, and you have three markers. The drone and the subject are kept in check with a mock-up system, so to have the ground truth. But what actually the drone is doing is following the human with the prediction running on board. And you see the prediction with this marker, the lightweight one, during the movement uh, of the of this uh, uh, this uh, colleague of mine of Jerome, I would say <laughs> during the movement of uh, of Jerome. Okay. Then last last part. I will uh, try to be very very fast on this uh, as the uh, timing is running out. Uh, and probably you have uh, a few questions. Uh, what we saw until now with the Pulp Frontnet uh, was uh, testing it. Uh, uh, within the same environment. So we need the mock-up to acquire the data and we want to assess the goodness also with the ground truth and the precise measurement so inside the same room. But what happened when, when we fly outside the uh, training domain, this uh, friendly environment? Usually this is a very common problem in deep learning and when you move to a different domain, the performance are not uh, as good as in the uh, comfortable one. And this is because uh, the visual cues learned during training probably are not present uh, or are different uh, from the um, in the deployment uh, domain. So something that you can do to uh, mitigate uh, and hopefully to solve this problem is to increase a lot uh, the variety of real world data. But as you saw before, we need this uh, mock-up system, it, and it would be really expensive and uh, time-consuming to set up uh, this uh, everywhere we want uh, to, to deploy. And uh, nevertheless, uh, it will, uh, uh, th there could be always some place that you didn't think about uh, that is not uh, covered from, uh, from this extension. So not really a viable option. The other extreme edge is uh, simulated data. With simulation, we can do uh, we can simulate a lot of places uh, with uh, uh, less effort, uh, less time. But uh, once again, it is not really uh, perfect, this solution. In particular, if you think about uh, human behavior, how to simulate them, the movement and the interaction uh, with the drone, even uh, if you, you can do quite uh, a lot of uh, uh, different places. But what we did, there was something in between, actually. Basically, we started with the real world data and then we introduced uh, the perturbation of the background. So kind of uh, uh, simulation in a sense. And this is done with uh, the technique called the background randomization. In a nutshell, the background randomization is a very uh, simple uh, approach that takes the, the input image. This is, uh, is done on the training set before training. We extract, we segment the image so to extract the foreground person, and then we replace the background with a bunch of them randomly selected from a different uh, data set. And this is actually quite good to teach the network that the part, the most important part where it should focus is not the background, but it is actually the person, and therefore the pose that is uh, uh, learning how to predict. Note that uh, this uh, technique has another very important advantage. It does not impact in any way the implementation, the uh, weight, the, 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 the size of the weight of the network that you deploy on the drone, because all of this uh, is done during training time. That means that you will end up with a different set of parameters, of course, but with not the difference in size or in the topology of the network. So you can really 
uh, plug uh, the new parameters uh, into the previous model and see how it behaves. And to do that, we had uh, actually we had uh, the, uh, a good opportunity. It was uh, at the beginning a bit of uh, annoying because we have to move a building. We moved in a new campus, but we, this was actually an opportunity to set up the mock-up system in a new environment. So we had uh, the chance to get uh, totally new um, data set with ground truth label to test and assess the accuracy of our generalization. So basically we trained, we used the pulp frontnet as before for the baseline, we trained with the background randomization that I show you, and we compared the performance of the two models in the friendly, the blue one, the known environment, the one um, from the training set, and a never seen before new environment, the new lab. And here you can see, once again, the R square, the um, regression performance on the uh, black baseline and the red, the proposed background randomization. And you can see that in the known test set, so feature coming from the uh, same place of the training images, both of them are performing good. The uh, proposed one is uh, sometimes a bit better, seems to be a bit better on some output and a bit uh, less uh, accurate on some other. But uh, until now, everything is in check because this is uh, the, comfortable, uh, the comfortable test set. What happened when we uh, change to the never seen before? Actually, here you can see that uh, the uh, proposed one with the background randomization is performing, uh, performing better on uh, uh, three out of four uh, output variables. On Z, I will give you uh, in a short while um, detail more on Z. Let's keep in hold for a moment. And uh, moreover, if you think about the relative drop in performance in the never seen before, you see that uh, the proposed uh, with background randomization lose uh, much less than uh, the baseline that uh, dramatically drops. Uh, on X and also on, uh, on phi. So about that, I said, this is a quite tricky. On one side, you always have a bit of uh, the uh, effect of the data set. So if the distribution, as I was saying before, is not really uh, well spread, you might uh, uh, penalize uh, a lot for uh, even a little errors. But uh, there is uh, something more about that that is um, currently under investigation and is uh, uh, the uh, I want to try to give you the intuition so basically if you have uh, the drone flying at different heights so for a different z with uh, um, with uh, the uh, pitch uh, the, the pitch angle the different pitch angle you might end up in a very similar almost identical image but still these uh, images uh, refer to different sets so this is the intuition we are working on now, that there is a strong connection between the pitch and the Z, and the image formation, of course, and also the Z um, output. And uh, we want to improve uh, these uh, in, the, in, the, in the next work uh, we will be doing. Last video, and then I conclude my talk. We tested uh, this, uh, uh, this network, um, this uh, random uh, background randomization version in uh, our coffee corner, our coffee room, really uh, something that uh, it is uh, very different from the training images. Also, if you see the onboard image down here, you have a lot of uh, uh, brightness uh, uh, behind, a lot of saturation uh, because of the natural light uh, that is not uh, present in any of the um, in any of the images used during training. You saw, uh, you, you see that uh, also other person uh, have been present uh, in, the, in the background uh, without uh, compromising uh, the behavior of the drone, the texture, the furniture, everything uh, is, uh, is, uh, is different uh, from the training uh, part. And with this, I conclude. So in summary, we saw uh, the uh, history of uh, part of our work on the a -based, uh, AI based uh, application as uh, Pulp Dronet uh, and Pulp Frontnet. You have open source for both of them. Also, the Pulp Frontnet is available on GitHub. You have videos, uh, there are publications. Uh, please uh, uh, take a look at them and uh, let us know 
if you have ideas or you want to uh, collaborate more. And with this, I thank you for the attention. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for a great talk. It's very interesting. A lot of nice things. We actually have a couple of questions. Good. So I'll start reading the first one. Uh, what are the major differences of Tiling scheme between Dory and Gapflow, uh, Auto Tyler? Uh, for a given topology, how can one determine which one is most suitable to use other than just trying? Yeah. I mean, the best uh, to understand, because there are tiny differences, uh, as you saw also in the performance with this uh, DroneNet network, the best is to, is to check the documentation, because uh, the differences are not major, but uh, given the, uh, for example, uh, the, um, the AutoTiler, the GapFlow tool, uh, um, uses uh, to merge uh, max pooling layer with the convolutional one that is uh, uh, next uh, next to it. You should have a look at the documentation. There are publications for the uh, Nemo Dory. Uh, there is uh, the um, good uh, documentation from Green Waves uh, for the GapFlow. So to check uh, these uh, small differences. Uh, and also how the tiling loop is organized because you can explore the tensor as you know by uh, depth on the channel first or with the feature wise uh, the h and the w dimension first so those are the differences are minor they might have an impact as you saw even though small impact so at the end of the day in terms of performance uh, both of them are very good and uh, um, please check uh, papers uh, for Nemo Dory and official documentation for the uh, Green Waves one. Yeah, thanks. Uh, what effect in terms of energy usage and throughput does quantization have for inference on traditional hardware like CPU and GPUs? Mm -hmm. So quantization as uh, first of all for us uh, and for all the configuration uh, where you don't have floating point unit uh, is a really fundamental because uh, the alternative would be um, soft float emulation that is way too expensive to run uh, in real time and to have an energy efficient implementation. So this is a, a very important uh, aspect on an architecture where you don't have floating point units. Then if you want to take advantage of quantization also having availability of a floating point, of course, is possible. Uh, for sure, you have, in terms of energy, reducing the data uh, type, you have uh, uh, to move uh, in and out among the various uh, hierarchy of the memory less uh, data with respect to floating point 32, for example. And then also there is another aspect uh, that, uh, depending on the specific hardware architecture you are using, you might enable uh, uh, optimization like a vectorization with 8-bit instead of a 16-bit data type means that you double the throughput. Because in one shot, if you feed uh, the pipeline with 32 bits, you are computing four outputs instead of two. That would be for a 16-bit um, quantization uh, scheme. So you, you, you have, uh, in this case, uh, fundamental problem of a missing floating point unit and general advantage of quantization that can be always uh, beneficial. Great. Um, one more. Why did you choose ResNet for your project? Does it align well with the design of the hardware? In general, is the hardware suitable for conventional custom neural network architecture as well? Yeah. As, uh, as you saw in the, in the talk, the ResNet was the, uh, introduced by the previous work. So the, the thing we, we could have done something uh, different for sure. For example, uh, deciding uh, to go with a brand new network uh, without ResNet. But we want to, to make the first step on solid ground. Solid ground means uh, I want to start from something that I trust. And in, for our case, uh, it was uh, first uh, the PALP drone that developed uh, at the robotic and perception, uh, sorry, the drone that developed at the robotic and perception group. And for the second project was the proximity neural network developed at the Dalle Molle Institute for Artificial Intelligence. And they were coming with this choice already made that was at that time quite standard and popular. So probably I would, I would have done the same 
if I have to design from scratch uh, the network. As you saw, in the first work, we kept the ResNet topology as it was. So the, the, between DroneNet and Pulp DroneNet, in terms of topology, there is a one-to-one -one, uh, matching. Instead, for the second work, and the second work, work could rely on a much more solid ground because of the, thanks to the Pulp DroneNet we did before, we start uh, changing that and removing the ResNet topology. So answering in a synthetic form to your question, the, the point is that we, we didn't uh, uh, choose to use ResNet because it was better for that task uh, with some specific uh, uh, improvement uh, in mind with respect to another network. Also, mobile net could, uh, could, could, be, uh, could be used, but it was uh, the previous work, and we actually saw with the PAL front net that for such a small uh, network, it seems that uh, the um, typical bypass is not really key to achieve uh, good performance. Great. Uh, is uh, hardware suitable for on-chip real-time learning for problems like lifelong learning? Sorry, is it uh, suitable for uh, which kind of problem? Uh, um, on-chip real-time learning yes. for problems like life lifelong learning. Yes. Real-time learning, uh, like uh, continuous learning or um, um, learning that uh, performs uh, during uh, the, the, the mission, so with the, the actual hardware, it's quite, it is quite expensive. With uh, uh, the computational capability of uh, uh, this uh, chip, uh, I would say it is uh, doable, but with a lot of constraints. What instead I would aim at is, um, if you remember at the beginning of the talk, uh, we, uh, I introduced also uh, these uh, accelerators uh, aspect of the PALP project that is uh, not uh, special of PALP. Accelerators are used and available in many, many modern uh, system on chip. So I would say yes, but with some special care in the, on the other side of the computational platform for uh, specific uh, continuous learning or uh, reinforcement learning in uh, um, running directly on board. Okay, so we have one last question. Uh, are you interested in any dense prediction tasks in the GAP-8? Dense, like... Uh... It was Rick's question and he's updating. Dense image predictions. Sorry, I don't get the question. Dense image production, like uh, the, the... Uh, with a dense output. No, there is probably I I, I can't hear you probably very well, but like uh, like I mean, segmentation. I think Rick has been working with segmentation. I mean, from the Greenway's uh, point of view, I cannot really speak for them. There is yeah. a, this afternoon a talk from. Uh, um, Dr. Francesco Paci, that uh, probably is the most uh, suitable person to answer that uh, that question. Yeah. Okay. Great. But then you you actually Sorry did part that. of my you actually did part of my job here because I wanted to introduce the talk from this afternoon. Yes. Uh, about the Gap Eight from uh, Green Wave. So if you're interested about the A Day Gap Eight and Green Wave, uh, definitely you should show up at thirteen thirty for Francesco Passi. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. That was uh, very interesting.